Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our discussions with Whitman's deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. We now will turn to starting from Pominox section number 17 out of some 19 sections. We are now down to the last three sections or poems of starting from Pominox. We will leave the difficult section 16 that we just finished and move on. And as we move on, and, and, and of course therein lies obviously a very difficult thing for us. As we say we are the stories that we tell and retell. We are also the stories we decide to accept and the stories that we decide to reject. We also like to say in 303 that the new is the new. That is to say the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. There's a certain kind of cyclical nature to our study of the stories that we love to tell and retell and the stories that we either decide to accept or to reject. And now as we turn to passage 17, we're going to ask, how does Whitman decide to move beyond the uh, challenges of the, of the 16th section where obviously he is making the observation that the native populations of America are for the most part now just names on a map somewhere and there's increasingly fewer and fewer of those people uh, and, and how does he move beyond all of that? We're going to turn to that now. Now the assumption is that you, um, speaking of prior lectures, you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, especially down that left-hand side there where you're going to find Talks with Walt in our playlist. My assumption is you've been working with us through the 24 poems of inscriptions and now up through the 16th uh, sections of starting from Pominot. As we turn now, we will move from the discussion of passage 16 and the melting and the departing of the native peoples as he will call them the red aborigines in his in his racist term for it to now passage 17 as we begin now to read this passage I want you to pay attention to after his comment about a pause in passage 16 he's now ready to reflect and to notice the first word of passage 17 expand Pay attention to all the I-N-G words in this poem. Now, of course, we're going to pay attention to this a lot in our study of Leaves of Grass, but for sure in this one at 2B. Expanding and swift, henceforth, elements, breeds, adjustments, turbulent, quick and audacious, a world primal again, vistas of glory, incessant and branching, a new race dominating previous ones and grander far with new contests, new politics, new literatures and religions, new inventions and arts. These, my voice announcing, I will sleep no more but arise, you oceans that have been calm within me, how I feel you, fathomless, stirring, preparing unprecedented waves and storms. Now, th this will be for us uh, uh, the passage that will follow again, that somewhat tragic passage 16. Many readers of Leaves of Grass, and this won't be the last time we will say this out loud for a number of you as readers will say, I really like starting from Pominock right up to passage 16, and then I had to deal with the fact that he is talking about the eradication in large measure of a whole group of peoples that we will call native. And now all of a sudden, how are we going to get beyond that? And he says, well, we're going to get beyond that by expanding. Swift and henceforward. In other words, one more time. We are moving forward. Let's go, let's go. And then he provides us with a list of six notice things here. Elements. Breeds, it's an interesting uh, word. Adjustments, obviously, any time that we're studying history of, of a culture, there are adjustments to be made. Notice turbulent, and Whitman was living, and he knew he was living in such turbulent times. Quick and audacious, obviously, audacious can be understood as both positive as well as negative, right? A world, and then he says, strangely, primal again. Primal again? Well, what do you mean primal again? Well, look at where we were in passage 16. Obviously primal as in natives. Now, in other words, the new Americas, he's going to use this word new. And this is where we get, in large measure, this phrase, the new is the new. The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. Everything is cyclical. It's such a powerful reminder for us that everything 
that comes around, in fact, does go around. Go back to our study of Greek theater and drama and tragedy, and of course it's always there, isn't it? I mean, that's the foundational understanding of Oedipus Rex, for example. Notice, a world primal again, and then he'll begin to celebrate. Vistas, and it's always about sight. We're going to get to the seeing uh, poem in passage 18 here in a while, but it's all about sight. Notice he says, vistas of glory incessant and branching. We've talked about this primal urging, this growing, this evolutionary kind of word picture he's always messing around with. And then he'll say it. And this is interesting because in the previous section he talked about how the native populations are melting and departing. Now we're going to be a new race dominating conquered peoples, as Voltaire pointed out, never get to write histories. It's always history, always written by the conquerors, right? A new race dominating previous ones. And again, this is a hard line for us. I know this is hard to read after passage 16, and yet read it we must. A new race dominating previous ones, and he will say it, grander far with, and then he's going to provide us with a number of these, five of these news, N-E-Ws, with new contests. Obviously, he was talking about wrestling earlier in a previous, in a previous um, set of lines in passage 15. New contests, new politics, new literatures and religions, he's mentioned already the fact that he himself wants to propagate a new religion, new inventions, we can't help but think after the listing of, of what was happening in passage 16 of the repeating rifle as, as, uh, as we start to head west in our study of U.S. history, right? New inventions and obviously new arts, right? And he himself, he doesn't say new arts, he just says it, new inventions and arts, but it's, it's clear, he wants to see leaves of grass as somehow as well, part of that new arts. And then there's a break. And then it's again evident that starting from Pominock, for Whitman was placed here before Song of Myself, unlike the original publishing in the 1855 edition, because he's here announcing again. And notice this will be just like earlier the announcements that he was making, right? Uh, and here the announcement is my voice announcing. Now, let's pause for a moment and point out, and notice the hyphen there to make us think of, of course, Emily Dickinson and the use of the hyphen. Uh, the, the voice of Whitman. By the way, we only have one actual recording of the voice of Whitman. You can look this up on YouTube, and it's kind of fascinating to hear it, because it doesn't sound like anything that you would probably expect Whitman's voice to sound like. Obviously, he's talking about the voice within the pages of Leaves of Grass. These, my voice announcing... And then he says it, I will sleep no more but arise. And we immediately have to think about our study of Thoreau's Walden. Um, and of course, in that famous passage where I went and what I live for, that is to say we must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by, an, what does he call it, infinite expectation of the dawn that does not forsake us in our sound asleep. And then he says it, I know no, no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of a man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. That idea of the conscious endeavor, that idea of well, I've got to find my way now to a new project, very Dante-esque, of course, as Dante himself, as writer, will create a poem where he in the Divine Comedy is the pilgrim that has to arise and have to go. We as well with this word arise, put in your notes, think about Yeats's uh, Lake Isle of Innsbruck. I will arise now and go, and he's going to build his little hut there and listen to bees and all of that, try to get away from the drum of the city. Obviously, we've said it in our lecture about that poem. He clearly never gets away. But this idea of trying to find a way to reawaken is here now. I will sleep no more. By the way, put it in your notes at 3A. We're going to meet, we're going to meet um, Whitman in one of his great poems. It's called The Sleepers, and so we're going to play around with that one. I will sleep no more but arise, and then he speaks directly now to oceans. You oceans that have been calm within me, exclamation point, how I feel you. Fathomless, stirring. Let's remind ourselves just for a moment, we haven't mentioned it a lot, but the, this poet who writes these lines is a contemporary of Melville, who will, of course, write the great text of the ocean in Moby Dick. Notice he says there's this stirring that's been happening, and we can't read this without thinking of, of Emerson's call in his essay, The Poet, to the longing, the, the need for someone to stir Americans to think about America as something other than European, right? Preparing unprecedented waves and storms. Now, of course, the storms will label Whitman as the iconoclast that obviously that he is. 
unprecedented, makes us think of Milton and Paradise Lost and the opening and the invocation of the muse, things yet unattempted, yet in prose or rhyme. In other words, Whitman is telling us one more time, I'm going to do what has never been done in poetry and certainly has never been done in American poetry before, which is why so many of us will call Whitman the father or the beginner or the genesis of American poetry in some ways. He really is the beginning of so much. At 2A, just to finish here, what are we going to say about a poem like this? Well, obviously, the way forward, and the only way forward, is through. I would say this is true of our study of Leaves of Grass. Some of us um, struggled with that last section, 16, and weren't sure whether we were even going to come back for one more section or not, and here we are back again. Why? Because what did Dante teach us in our study of the Divine Comedy? You don't go to hell, you go through hell if you're Dante the Pilgrim, right? And to that degree... The way through is the way forward, right? And we've got to, we've got to continue to, to realize and remember that. Obviously, the new is the new is also a very interesting mantra for a study like this. Notice all of these news, but it's all about cycles. And every time we come to an N-E-W, it really is a K-N-E-W. It's something that was manifestly known from before. The perennial philosophy is the language that we use, obviously, for these ideas that are old, that are rediscovered time and again, right? At 2 be. Again, I wanted to point out all these ing words and why we see so many of them throughout these of grass. They're very active kinds of words. Notice how they get used here. There's a certain kind of melodic lilt as well that will be achieved through this kind of thing. At 3A, we've mentioned, obviously, Thoreau's Walden and Yeats's Lake Isle of Inspiration, Milton's Paradise Lost, as well as any other texts, uh, anything by Wendell Berry that would come to mind about returning back to a certain understanding of the primal coming back to the old and somehow re-experiencing it as the new. Finally, at 3b, to try and own a text like this in this poem, why do you think it is so hard to reawaken and, as Thoreau will call it, keep ourselves awake? Notice here, Whitman, quite older in his life, will say, it's time for me to wake up, which is obviously another question. For you, have you awakened, uh, to use obviously the word picture of uh, Plato's Republic, and especially Book 7 in the Cave Allegory, sitting, looking at shadows on a wall chained up. There has to be that instructor, that pedagogue, that teacher who will awaken us, unchain us, and of course dragging and kicking, usually kicking and screaming, dragging us out of the cave because of the fear and pain that must be a part of that. To what degree is that happening in your life? How about this for a final question? Have you felt the oceans in you? Stirring, and to what degree have you felt that, and how have you felt inspired to do something with that? We now turn from passage 16, 17 on to the passage 18, and now we're just two away from completing, starting from Pomodoc, and the famous C as in S E E poem. We're going to see that uh, a repetition again in the cataloging that will play that game of Whitman. Thank you.